Dr. Jainarayan Vas, welcome to Dateline Gujarat. The biggest issue today, which is there, is of the demonetization. Cracking this code of demonetization, because what we understand, the way Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi, addressed on 8 November 2016 night, saying that the 500 rupee and 1000 rupee notes are going to be no more in practice. They are banned from today from India. Since then, what we have seen is that there has been a kind of a pro and an anti spam were happening on the social media few favoring the demonetization and few clearly against it what is your view as somebody who has studied the economies of the world as one of the economists and the way you see the perseverance happening in the political dimensions just not in india but globally and how is this economic tool of demonetization really going to help india from here so my first question is how do you see this demonetization step See, let's understand the purpose behind it. The purpose behind it is to curb the parallel economy, which has grown substantially big as far as India is concerned, and also eliminate fake notes, which are used for all kind of antisocial activities, including terrorism. So if you look at the objective behind the demonetization, I think it's well in place. How do you see this decision of government, you know, banning the notes? Because the notes which I studied uh, based on the uh, study which you have done, 85 percentage of the notes which are in practice, in currency and the kind of cash currency the India is. So how do you see this decision in that particular province, keeping in view the gl other global economies also? See, before I answer you, let us understand the situation in India. You have 20% of the GDP roughly coming from agriculture, where the entire dealings are in cash. You have 60% plus GDP coming up from service sector, where almost 50% plus dealings are in cash. And you have remaining GDP coming from the organized sector or industrial sector, where about 5% of the GDP is, gets transacted in cash. So you are talking about an economy where almost two-thirds of the size of the GDP is cash transaction. So in a true sense, Indian economy is a cash economy and everything that is cash is not a black money. So let's, let's draw a difference there that if, if you are talking about cash, it is, it is the way the um, assets uh, get transacted here and the way the ownership changes in concentration of uh, uh, the currency notes. So it will be imprudent to say that uh, anything that is in form of currency is, is, is by and large a dangerous or a potentially dangerous thing. That's not uh, the fact. Having said this, now coming to your question, you very rightly said 85% of the value is by way of 500 and 1000 rupee notes. That also doesn't worry me. You know, you understand the intrinsic value of the money or the currency. That is more important. You know, when you talk of 500 rupees, and if I connect it back to the early years of independence in this country, pure ghee was available at 20 rupees. Today it is available at 600 rupees. So it is, it is if, if you have 500 rupees note, it is less than 20 rupees. Uh, in intrinsic value. Uh, best thing, world over accepted norm is to compare it with value of gold. The gold was available at that time at 100 rupees per 10 gram. Today it is 30,000 rupees on a very, very uh, sober and conservative estimate. Though it soared to as high as 50, 55,000 rupees, but I am not taking that value. That means that today's 500 rupees in gold parity, where gold has appreciated. 300 times, the same note of 500 rupees is, is less than 5 rupees in the intrinsic value comparable with gold. So the bigger notes in a sense are not only used by the privileged class of selective few having the uh, top uh, bracket income. They are normally used currencies. And therefore, you should understand the kind of job, Herculean task that the government has on hand 
is you are talking about you know in, in uh, as you very rightly said 85 percent of value is in uh, 500 and thousand rupees notes this precisely account for 46 percent of the number that is roughly 96 billion 46 percent of that roughly you are talking about is in by way of number of pieces 500 and thousand rupees so you are talking about dealing with roughly about 48 billion pieces of currency notes which were required to be exchanged and therefore initially the kind of reaction that you saw first that it is a common man's use legal tender now because of its intrinsic value and price purchase parity and second the huge number of pieces of notes that will be required to change I think initially what uh, uh, problems you found were because of that. So do you see there is a kind of, you know, uh, something which has gone, uh, which has not been studied well on the government's part or government was aware? Because in one of the interviews, the ex-finance minister P. Chidambaram said that 2,100 crore notes have been sucked out of the economy all of a sudden. It has been banned. The printing capacity of the nation today is somewhere 300 crore notes per month. So if you say otherwise, replacing even with that with the same uh, denomination would take another 7 months. And if you constitute it otherwise in terms of a 10 times value, because you take out a 1000 rupee note and you replace it with 100 rupee note or a 500 rupee note, which is to be replaced with another 5 notes of 100 rupees. So it's somewhere a kind of printing almost 8000 currency 8,000 crore currency notes and do you see this was not somewhere studied by the bureaucracy which has advised this to the Prime Minister or the advisors of the Prime Minister or the Prime Minister himself who is a Gujarati, a number cruncher did not take this somewhere seriously. See I am not privy to the decision making process. So I would for one not hazard with saying or answering your question straight away yes or no. But as I have learned, being a bureaucrat earlier and then in the public life, such decisions are taken after a very, very uh, detailed analysis and proper thinking. So to say that Government of India would have taken this decision without any thinking, I think uh, uh, Mr. Chidambaram himself being a responsible public life leader and functionary and a former finance minister would not have made this statement, I am sure. It would have been taken with all due considerations and the consequences. Now, the number you gave, again, see, the, the statistics are double-edged tools. Number you gave sounds what Chidambaram made a rough back-of-the-cover calculation. Our entire currency notes volume in circulation, you can replace them simultaneously because you will be dealing with the circulating currency notes only to start with or those who need to exchange it for the immediate purpose. The currency notes which are in the strong rooms of the banks or the currency chests of the banks can wait for a while. So I think to make that straight calculation of about seven months is in the first instance wrong and also to believe that Earlier three or four months were not used for printing these currency notes also is wrong. So when you put these things together, I think it answers Mr. Chidambaram very well that there is something wrong or he has deliberately tried to uh, uh, hit the ball tangentially misguiding the people. Okay. Uh, when you say that curbing a high denomination notes of 500 and 1000 rupees will somewhere help curb the black economy. Could you just define the parallel black economy as to vice versa, what is it with the GDP of India and other countries worldwide? See, you can safely take GDP of India today as the third largest economy in the world in the price purchase parity terms, around 6 trillion US dollars plus. Now, having said this, let me also tell you that currency notes is the last form in which, uh, see, first of all, let me blast this notion that this black money or a parallel economy is stacked somewhere. No, it is not. Like your legal uh, system, 
the parallel economy also is continuously working and earning rewards on that. So when Mr. Morarji Desai came out with banning that 1000 rupees note, it was 8000 crore size. Today it is 50 lakh crore size. So it's not a static economy which is lying somewhere waiting for you to pounce upon. It's not. So first form in which you will find this money invested is the uh, real estate, housing and the kind of assets that, that go with land and uh, building. Then you might uh, go up to the precious metals, gold, silver, platinum. Then jewelry, diamonds and uh, uh, other forms of jewelry. Then it will be in form of uh, the Benami holdings. Then it will be in form of the uh, stock in trade or finished goods undervalued or overvalued and also in terms of the kind of exports or import figures inflated or deflated to suit the transactions. The currency notes is the last form in which the uh, um, uh, um, parallel economy money will be found. And I am I am missed one. I, I have missed one important uh, uh, element also where you have accounts in foreign banks abroad. Sure. So I think currency note is just the first step to begin with. Okay. It might account for barely less than uh, seven percent of the size of the parallel economy. But what's the size of the you know I mean the uh, what do you call the size of the GDP and the kind of percentage if you talk of the parallel black money economy in India and rest of the countries? See, normally you talk about cash GDP ratio to compare this. In India, the cash GDP ratio is around 12. Most of the countries, the cash GDP ratio is 3 to 4 percent, which are developed countries. But let us not forget that countries like UK, you have 80 percent plus transactions which are cashless transactions. So, you know, you, 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 you cannot take in isolation in an economy which is 70% plus cash and barely 2 lakh uh, credit cards and uh, roughly 14 lakh swap, uh, swiping machines with some economy which is 80% plus cashless economy. So, this cash GDP ratio comparison also must be done with very, very careful consideration and it should be sort of balance for the kind of the size of cash economy vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, cash GDP ratio. But uh, what is the reason you know when you talk I mean the, when you're talking of the informal employment basically what is the reason that today we are more a cash uh, uh, I mean our cash GDP ratio is higher we are more a cash transaction economy. See you we, we started as an agrarian economy the the if you look at earlier GDP composition it was uh, um, uh, 50 percent plus agriculture and then uh, uh, remaining industry. Service sector was not much in the poor. From there we have changed. So now let us understand the cash handling. Where, where does it take place? It takes place in the rural India, the farmers who deal uh, where you know the expanse of the banking sector even today is very very limited even today 30 crore people have no access to the banking system during those days banking system itself was in a primitive stage so obviously the the indian economy when we started uh, breathing free air when we were paying the first five year plan was an economy where cashless transaction mechanism was virtually non existent banking mechanism and banking infrastructure was in its primitive stage and therefore we started with a cash economy we are continuing with it larger is the size larger are the layers of inefficiency so for the size of india and the kind of infrastructure that you need to convert this cash economy into the cashless economy is going to be so huge. I am not. I am not pessimistic. I, I don't say that it will not get converted. But to expect that it will get converted overnight is daydreaming or fooling somebody. Okay. Uh, as you rightly say, the kind of cash GDP ratio, the kind of cash transactions due to the agricultural economy, due to the informal employment, the member task the government today is in 50 days is to curb the black economy. 
What's the kind of percentage you talk when you talk of the other continents in India in terms of the black e parallel black economy as compared to the world economy? See, if you take those 96 developing countries, it is about 38% compared to India tw between 23 to 26 percent. Most of the developing countries, in, like countries like Africa and others, it is above 40%. So, I don't think that India should be having a reason to worry that their parallel economy has gone out of control. In fact, in, if you take those 96 countries, our uh, percentile size is far, far better. If you take African and other countries, which are developing countries, it is even still better. So, yes, there is an issue of parallel economy, but I don't think it is out of control. I mean, if, you, if I study your notes, even it says somewhere that, you know, our uh, parallel black economy is even less than the Asian continent percentage, which is 20 to 30 percent. Yeah. So, what could be the reason, you know, when, you are, when India is the center of Asia, the bright spot in the economy, why are we less as compared to when you talk of a parallel black economy? Is it the informal occupational uh, output, basically, or the output from the agrarian economy or the cash transactions? I think it is partly this and partly that. Both both are the reasons which are responsible for it. But I won't blame the cash transactions as much as people are blaming it because you cannot, and I personally believe that another 20, 30 years minimum, you will not be talking about the cashless economy that is being touted around. Okay. Okay. Interestingly, the two uh, important issues which the Prime Minister wants to address by demonetization of 500 and 1000 rupee notes is, one is curbing terrorism, second is bringing a kind of a white economy into the picture. How do you see this happening? Because yesterday we saw a terrorist has got a 2000 rupee note and a common man who is standing in a line. I am not worried about that. A terrorist getting some 2000 rupees note it is going to happen because most of the terrorist organizations do have sleeper cells in india so i don't want to be so theoretical to say that tomorrow itself the terrorist active in fact one of the problems india will be facing in the years to come will be combating the terrorism and it is there where this kind of money if you permit them to grow will find more and more use fake currencies you know in in in, uh, in economic parlance it is said that it is the bad tender that drives away the legal tender once you put the fake currency in circulation the ultimate sufferer is the real currency so i think both the objectives that the prime minister is talking about are very well conceived and in place and india has a reason to worry about the internal uh, uh, terrorism or uh, divisive forces like Maoism or Naxalism and also the fake currency notes. I think both the issues would increasingly bother this country in the years to come. So it's largely the informal uh, occupations from where the cash is generated which gets circulated again into the same system, it falls in hand to these kind of uh, anti-national forces because it's somewhere not formalized, the sector is not formalized you would say. See, you should understand that with all the industrial progress and all this uh, 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 we are talking about, still 50% of the em informal employment is provided by agriculture. And agriculture deals with 90% plus cash only. Which now is not taxable again. Agriculture is not taxable, but these farmers also, you know, you should also, there is an interesting thing we will talk about some sometimes uh, later. The fragmentation of land, which is happening so fast in India, is now making almost 99% of the farmers either small or marginal farmers. Sure. So they have least capability to deal with the uh, formal kind of dealings. Okay, okay. That's an interesting uh, outcome which comes out of this discussion that farmers are, the marginal lands are getting, uh, I mean they are getting squeezed off and they are not in a position to deal with the kind of formal set of deals. You are right. I will only make a statement today that this Gujar, Jat, Patidar or uh, Maratha uh, violent agitations for reservation, don't look them by caste. 
basically they are by the farmers com community which is being increasingly driven closer to the poverty line that's that's a wonderful observation i suppose but how do you see prime minister we will be prime minister will be able to address we are talking somewhere 7.9 percentage growth bright spot in the economy interesting parallels which i would like to talk today is that the china depreciates the currency which makes an impact on the global markets india bans the currency it hits the economy it hits the local uh, buying power basically today if i meet anybody i just happened to meet one one of my old boarding friends yesterday night and he said we are back in the boarding days i hardly have three notes of 10 rupees in my pocket and uh, but i mean some friends were together and we just did a kind of soldiery for a cup of tea so how do you see this basically say this builds a comradeship amongst your friends no problem but say let us understand we at times jump to conclusions and at times compare apples with oranges china depreciating the currency you should understand that china's share in the world trade is 18 and a half percent plus your share in the world trade is less than 2 percent so how does it matter your exports are anyway not earning you a major reward you have world's largest pre market you have internal uh, capabilities and strength to sustain it so china uh, whatever china is doing it suits their economy whatever we are doing must suit our economy so because china is doing something we should also fall in queue i don't agree with that kind of a logic no, but how do you see this you know when you're talking it as it's a bright spot in economy no it's not comparable 7.9 percentage growth well how do you see with this you know really you know, this with the present situation yes and also with the uh, the kind of impact it can have for initial 2 to 3 years it will have the impact on the gdp growth and and we can th uh, uh, look forward or i mean we should not be surprised if the gdp growth uh, drops to 4.5% to 5% so you know you if if nothing is free if you are gaining somewhere you have to sacrifice somewhere else so i think everything has a cost and a cost tag attached to this is it will initially have a con control on the gdp it might have also with gst coming it might also push up prices okay. so uh, all these things put together i think next 3 or 4 year or maybe 5 years would require the best of the talents i repeat the best of the talents the best of the brains and the political determination to drive indian economy safe to the shore what kind of impact do you see basically when you talk on terms of sector of manufacturing trade construction logistics infrastructure all these areas well immediate impact these are the stressed areas and right? the power sector has uh, hit the infrastructure the infrastructure growth is slow i mean if you see the manufacturing economy is down because the global demands are down trade itself is in its own uh, par paradigm you know i mean the currency wars are a different story global currency is hitting the indian currency so how do you see this impact basically short term or long term on several sectors and could you just uh, timeline those sectors basically see as i told you that the initial impact will be that of a recession for 2 to 3 years you should be prepared for a hard life now there are again areas for example if your monsoon is good and if the crops are good there is more money in the rural economy your consumer goods may not be hit as much as one would be fearing the also goods like uh, motorcycles or automobiles in tractors in rural areas may not again get same impact of recession as one might be fearing of but then this is all dependent upon the agriculture and how best you are going to have the growth rate of the agriculture you give me a point to debate on that marginal farmers and agriculture that's where i would take, like yes. to tackle that, that issue in that direction yes but today if we are talking analysts worldwide before may 2014 we were talking that dollar would crash india is a bright spot in economy india is this india has a complete growth story plan and everything today all of a sudden the paradigm has changed the world now is cutting somewhere on the india growth story today itself in the rajya sabha the ex prime minister dr manmohan singh said that show me a single country which has gone for cutting and 
putting its own population for not taking the money earned by it themselves from the bank. I would definitely argue to this saying that Greece is one nation which went recently into the crisis with a 40 euros cap limit. But how do you define this, you know, basically? Well, I won't uh, uh, get tempted and rush into the comparison of stories like Greece. These this, this were inflation driven uh, situations. The economy was virtually uh, broken or on the brink of breaking down. India is not in that. <coughs> so we should not we should not forget that you are talking about a country which is second largest and soon it will be the first largest populated country in the world. So it has its own demand that will drive the economy. Second is that if you talk about gold, you know, world is talking about gold reserves and all that. Since the day the gold was found in the world, 10% of the gold is in India. We for years are the highest purchasers of gold every year. It is in excess of 1000 tons. We have 180,000 tons plus silver. So India is a poor country if you go by 650 tons plus reserve, gold reserve oil with the reserve bank. But if you look at the fact that per capita saving also, we are one of the highest per capita GDP saving countries in the world. Then there is an internal inherent strength in your economy. And the population can always not be a disadvantage. It is also an advantage when it comes to consuming goods and services. So I don't think and I am not so pessimistic as Dr. Manmohan Singh is and I think at his age he is right, he should be. I am not so pessimistic to believe that Indian economy is on the verge of breaking down. No, it is not. The issue has more kind of driven a political fuel today. The Congress has given a call of Bandha on 28. There's more driving of politics, a kind of, you know, uh, the statements coming from West Bengal, from West Bengal Chief Minister Nanta Banerjee, the kind of statements coming from Arvind Kejriwal, the Delhi Chief Minister. How do you see this, you know, is this a, the economy has become a kind of tool of a political battle today? Because what I understand, the side effect of this fantastic decision is what? The people who are not understanding economy, today because of WhatsApp or Facebook or whatever Twitter you call it, I see majority of Indians today talking economy, understanding the size of the GDP. So these are the basic things which probably Indians were never interested at one point of time. There was a limited class which used to talk this. Very today I see a simple guy doing a simple humble business also talking on these parameters. Yes. So has somewhere the economy of a nation become today a political tool because if we see in past, it was something like the, it was to capture an administration to rule globally. Then came the phase when in the economic uh, captivity was considered to be one of the part of the globalization and now today India we see economy has become a battle of politics or a tool of politics. How do you see this situation? See where in the world it, it didn't become? When Margaret Thatcher came to power, Britain was almost crippled because of the coal miners strike and, and that became the hot issue. Recent elections in United States you have seen, most of the issues debated directly, indirectly were related with the economy. So, in a democratic situation where the people choose the governments, the issues which bother them, economy being one of the foremost issues that bothers them, being debated should not make us nervous. And in India additionally, one of the largest Indian states, Uttar Pradesh, and another border state of Punjab, they are immediately in a very short future going to polls. Then will be the turn of Goa and Karnataka. So when you have an election in 2017 as, as, as many as four states and then Gujarat, the fifth, I think these issues are going to be politicalized. Political parties, if they don't take advantage of it, then I think they are not worth their salt. And so the ruling party should not worry about it. This is, this is, this is what happens. The friction destroys the best of the energy. But then if you don't have friction, you can't walk. In a democracy, this is bound to happen and it should be taken it in its own stride. Last question to Dr. Jainal Andreas is that 
there is a lot of messaging going on on the positive note saying that the house prices will come down the loans will be cheaper but what is the present scenario is that the interest rates have gone down on the fixed deposits there is no clarity on the interest rates on the borrowing if somebody wants to start a business or a buy a home loan or an auto loan or whatever it is spending decisions have all of a sudden come to such a level that if a food has been made today in a house one time and it is something limiting a little something little is added and it's cooked for an evening meal so how do you see this in terms of the future move of making every a kind of dream with the prime ministers of giving home to an every indian making loans cheap and uh, desirable with the consumption power increases there is a seventh pay commission which is in action the gst is to happen so it's a kind of a lot of economic action which is awaited now well again you should not interpret anything in isolation houses prices will go, go down good because of what because there may be lesser demands or less liquidity that is that is as far as those who want to purchase the house it is good scenario but then at the same time you are also talking about lowering the interest rates now once you roll, lower the interest rates especially the pensioners and others who are surviving on the fixed income they are bound to hit so ultimately somewhere there is a going, there is going to be a trade off 100% this way or 100% this way is not going to happen it's a mixed bag somewhere you will gain somewhere you will lose you know for any any human being it is said that success in one compartment of life is always at the cost of some sacrifice in some other compartment of life so ultimately so far so in the end game you get something which is positive some total of it your balance sheet is positive i think this has done a uh, good job and favorable impact on the overall living and the lifestyle of average indian if it doesn't then it will be a disaster uh you are somebody who speaks with the heart and that's the reason we took this theme of an interview in such a manner wherein we have used the natural lighting we have not used any artificial lighting your left side because you talk your heart is on the lighter side your right side is a little dark because 50 days is something we all are awaiting today in india and after 50 days we would see the daylight as to what is really happening till then thanks a lot for speaking to dateline gujarat and dissecting and bisecting this whole subject of demonetization because dateline gujarat as a policy has not uttered a word on this topic but for the first time we are talking to you because we want to talk to people who sensibly can interpret the economy who can sensibly talk in a right guidance note can sensibly end it saying that if it does not happen if the goals are not attained it would be a disaster thanks a lot dr janar and we are speaking to dateline gujarat thank you my pleasure